and welcome to another GEB America podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gunn. Special thanks to our sponsor of the GEB America podcast, Gladius Solutions. Go to GladiusSolutions.com for more information. Also want to share a special welcome to our Pray.com audience and those who are tuning in on Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts. The views and opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the speakers and not necessarily those of GEB America, Oral Roberts University, or their employees. This program is not intended to offer investment, financial, medical, legal, or any other advice. Viewers should consult a subject matter professional regarding any such matters. Today, we have a friend from the Tennessee area, Bishop Kevin Wallace, with us joining us. We are so thankful for you to be with us, Bishop Kevin. Thank you, Stephen, for the opportunity to be with you and uh, grateful for this connection and all the wonderful things you guys are doing there at ORU and looking forward to our time together today. Indeed, indeed. And uh, Kevin, uh, we were talking beforehand about kind of covering the corridor of the, the Chattanooga, the Tennessee area there, been there. Uh, it's, I love that area. It's a beautiful part of the country, um, beautiful to visit. And uh, so we're excited to get to talk today. Um, and you are you married to Devin? Married to Devin. Wallace and uh, Devin lead pastors Wallace. of Redemption to the Nation's Church, and we'll get into more of that later here. But uh, let's let's dig in. We're excited for this time today, and uh, let's <clears throat> let's just start. Kind of where I'll, I like the question is kind of where where did we get? How did we get to here? Right? How did we get here? Sure. Tell us kind of a little bit, kind of your backstory, maybe, and uh, how the church and all that kind of thing together. You can, like I said, we can kind of go the family route, and uh, right. just love to hear, hear get to know right. you more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Stephen. Well, I was born and raised right here in the um, inner city of Chattanooga, uh, so uh, most all of my child- childhood and adolescent life, I was in the inner city of Chattanooga. Got a little older, and we moved to. Uh, a different area uh, of the community, but um, in downtown Chattanooga, born and raised in uh, what I would call a holiness, a small holiness church uh, filled with the spirit of God, filled with loving, praying people. And so was always uh, around that and uh, grew up in that. And uh, that had a profound impact on my life and uh, was, you know, in the shaping of my spiritual walk with God. And so um, grew up in Chattanooga, grew up here in the inner city and moved away uh, to um, Cleveland, Tennessee when I was 17 years old and went to a school there, Lee University. And um, just before I went to school, I had a dream the week before I went to school, in fact, um, I was trying to find out what I was going to do with my life. I knew I felt the call to preach, um, but I was trying to discern what the Lord was saying to me and where do we go with this? You know, what do we do with this call of God? And sort of in the, the church I was raised in, uh, uh, they were God fearing people, loved Jesus, loved to pray, loved to, to be together, but they weren't so big on pointing us toward, you know, education. Um, mm. that was, a uh, uh, a new thing for me. Um, and one of my spiritual fathers said, you need to go, uh, to this university right up the road from you, um, here in Chattanooga. And so I did. And the week before I went to the university, made a commitment to go there, a dream that I was in a jungle and, um, it was the realest dream I've ever had in my life. And I'm 44 today. So 27 years ago, I had this dream and I still remember with vivid detail, Wow. Um, the happenings of that dream. And in this dream, I was in a jungle and I had this sword and, uh, it looked like a machete slash sword. It was kind of a weird thing. And I start cutting the jungle and walking through and I turn around and my mom and dad are with me. And I walked a little bit more and cut some more jungle out. And I turn around and my Sunday school teacher was following me. And, um, I keep cutting my way through this jungle. And I kept, I'm 17 at the time. I kept turning around and there were hundreds of people. And then there were thousands of people. It was weird. Um, and I'm like, what is going on? These people are following me and I've got to, you know, cut through the jungle. And so all of a sudden in the jungle, a snake comes down out of the tree. It's staring at me in the face. In the dream, I actually felt the breath of the snake, which is totally weird, but I did. And I was <laughs> yeah. paralyzed in fear. I'll never forget its eyes staring in my eyes. I was terrified until I remember I had a sword and I cut the head of that snake off. And when that snake's head hit the ground, it began to rain so fast in the dream that the water piled up 
and went over my head and I woke up with water gushing over my head. And um, my mom said I laid in my bed and prayed in the spirit for hours after that dream and that encounter. And it was it was a life shifting, you know, uh, life altering dream. And I I carried that dream with me my freshman year, uh, my sophomore year. Uh, my sophomore year of Lee, I went on the field of evangelism full time. So I left school. I did go back and finish, but I left school. Doors were flying open and uh, ministry opportunities. And then a, a period of three days, I, and that's a true story, in a period of three days, my calendar filled up. I still have no explanation for it, but the, but the call of God, Come people on. started calling me. And in three days, I was booked to preach for six straight months. Wow. And I didn't have connections. My father and mother were love, God-loving, God-fearing people, but I didn't come from a line of ministry. I didn't come from a pedigree of pastors and evangelists. I, uh, I had no real connection, but God gave strategic connection uh, while I was at Lee for those two years. I met my spiritual father who's in heaven now. Um, uh, I say spiritual father. I have a, a few men that have been really... Uh, foundational in my life. And David Horton, Dr. David Horton, mm -hmm. I met him there. He taught me everything I know about worship and died uh, uh, of a heart attack, in my opinion, prematurely, but uh, in his late fifties, but he was a tremendous man of God. And while I was at Lee, he poured in and um, taught me everything I know about worship. And from those encounters, um, I would, I, I just saw the Lord open doors. And so we went into evangelism full time. I then went on my wife's staff as an associate pastor for a year and a half. And after a year and a half of associate pastoring in the denomination, uh, that I was a part of, uh, the church of God, which I still have great love and affection for, um, uh, the state bishop, Dr. Dennis McGuire called me one night. He said, I have a church that I went down and ran your name at, and you're going to go be the pastor. And I thought, what in the world is going on? <laughs> I was 22 years old, Stephen, if you can believe that. The church had 34 people. And um, and in 2003 of February, uh, I began pastoring what was then the Mountain Meadows Church of God. And mm. so uh, I was, uh, again, 22. I had one child. Jeremiah was one year old. Um Devin was pregnant with Isaiah, and uh, we moved our family to Chattanooga. And when I was given that opportunity to go to Ottawa, I asked the Lord, is this the fulfillment of the dream you gave me when I was 17 years old? God never answered that question in prayer. He never said yes. He never said no. What he did say is, this move is my will for your life, and I want you to go to Ottawa." And I want you to pastor this church. And so at 22, I went to Ottawa. Devin and I began to be senior pastors of that church with 34 people. From the first service with 34 people to the second service on the next Sunday, I successfully grew the church from 34 to 24. And uh, so we had 10, we had 10, uh, 10 people who said, uh, we're, this is not where we're going. And I totally understand. I, I'm sure I freaked everybody out. But long story short, that is um, still the, the 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 church that we are in and mm. um, have been, and I'll tell more about that story if you'd like, Stephen. But uh, pastoring the same people uh, for the last twenty two years, twenty three years now, and um, so I'm forty five soon, and um, and so we moved a couple of times, and now we are in. This is so unique and wild, but we are actually in what used to be the Highland Park Baptist Church oh. in downtown Chattanooga, okay. and our and the building that we're in right now as we're doing this podcast is on the property of what used to be Tennessee Temple University, oh, wow. and so we bought the church first, and three years later, uh, through a set of miracles, we bought the entire university, and... Um, and uh, the buildings were old, and a number of them dilapidated. All of them were dated, and so it's been a marathon of of <laughs> renovation. Uh, but I am sitting here today four, maybe five blocks away from the little house I was raised in. Oh, my uh, goodness. And never in one million years could you have ever caused me to believe 
that that big old church I passed every day as a child uh, would somehow be the church that God allowed us to have and do ministry from uh, from 2013 when we bought it until now 2024. So wow, sort of how we got here. Um, yeah. Devin and I got married uh, at a young. I was 19. Actually, the day I turned 20, we got married. She was still 19. So we've been married. God, I better get this right. Uh, 25, 24 years, 25 years. And, um, and we have six beautiful children. Oh, wow. Uh, Jeremiah's 23, Isaiah's 21. Zion, my oldest girl is 18. And Judah, my baby girl is, uh, 17. And then three years ago, we adopted, uh, oh. Genesis Amaya Wallace. Come on. Uh, on the day she was born. Um, I was the first man to hold her and Devin was the first lady to hold her and we've held her ever since and then we adopted Asher her brother by blood he's actually her uncle which is a whole other story uh (laughs) but uh by blood he's her uncle by adoption he's her brother so we call him Bunkle he's a Bunkle Bunkle. Uh, brother and uncle so he's Bunkle Asher uh but we have six children and um and we've been here for uh, in the inner city campus, the, what we call the main campus since 2013. And from there, God has helped us to continue to expand his kingdom and advance his purposes and his calls in the earth. And that's sort of a short synopsis on how we got here. Yeah, that's wonderful. Wow. That is amazing. I, uh, wow. There's so much to unpack there. Um, there is, <laughs> there really there is. is. I mean, just the faithfulness, the, the full circle moment of you getting to come like be so close to your own, you know, street that you grew up on. You know, that was a um, miracle too, Stephen. I, <clears throat> we were in Ultawa, the, the, the main campus where we started when I was 22 and everything was going so well. We had multiple services there. We were building, we were expanding. We had a miracle happen while we were at the Ultawa campus. I had just built the Ultawa campus. I had just built a children's uh, facility expansion. And it was in about the worst economy in American history, 2008. You remember the housing crisis and oh, yes. uh, the lending, thus the lending crisis. And of course you would know this um, more so perhaps than some folk who are uh, not necessarily in the, uh, the business side of church. If you have no understanding of the business side of church, you could miss this, but banks don't <laughs> typically lend favorably to, to churches, especially in the kind of economy <laughs> right. that uh, we were in in 2008. So we had just borrowed two and a half million, almost $3 million, actually $2.8 million in that horrible economy. That was a mm. miracle to even procure that loan. And we got that building built. And a month before we started paying principal and interest, um, some supernatural things started happening. And, and, and all of it, you know, the way I teach God's blessing and God's wealth and God's provision is I, God won't make you do anything, but he will invite you into supernatural opportunities, That's right. supernatural That's right. moments. And yeah. we were in a deacon meeting and we were uh, 2.8 million in debt and horrible economy i'm trying to figure out how to you know how we're going to pay this principal and interest we got 30 days maybe 25 days before uh we start paying that payment we're in a deacon meeting and we're having this business conversation and i said i want us to believe god for a five-year strategy to be completely out of debt and well that would have mm. been a miracle but I, I i was believing god for it and when i said that one of my trustees dean sykes he he clapped his hands and He said, the spirit of God just spoke to me. He said, that harvest is attached to a seed. And he said, God is going to require this house to be generous in this season. And if we'll trust him, he'll take care of the rest. And so in that night, we gave the largest gifts we had ever given to inner city ministry, to other churches in our community, to missionaries that were doing gospel work around the world. We gave away a significant amount of money. It was sacrificial. We yeah. felt every penny of it leave our hands, <laughs> and we sewed it, and I sewed it thinking this is either the greatest God moment in our life or this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. That's right. Uh, and so the next day, I take those offerings, and I drop them off, and we give those offerings to those ministry leaders. And 
I had set up a lunch with a man who wanted to meet with our, just Devin and I, he and his wife wanted to have lunch. I have never met the man. I did not know anything about the man. In fact, I would have never, to be quite honest with you, I'd have never had lunch with the dear brother, except my worship pastor said to me when he come to me, he said, Bishop, a gentleman come to me and wants to have lunch with you tomorrow. And I said, Jim, I don't, I don't meet with people on Monday. I'm exhausted on Monday. I preached four times on Sunday. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. I'm sleeping in Monday. I'm mush, you know? <laughs> so he said to me these words, he said, no, God told me you're supposed to meet this man for lunch. And I said, mm. you know, my worship pastor, he's never told me God told him anything. I didn't know he heard the voice of God. I didn't, know, <laughs> I didn't even know he could hear God. You hope so, he does. <laughs> yeah, you hope he's hearing God. And so, um, so he says to me, you're supposed to meet, eat lunch with this guy. So, I deliver these checks, drop them off. True story. Devin and I go and we have lunch with a family at PF Chang's. I've never met before. I don't even know who I'm looking for. I have no clue what the gentleman and his wife look like. I'm sitting down on a bench waiting on two people to walk up to me and go, Hey, we're so and so. We want to take you to lunch. And that's exactly what happened. He walks up with flip flops on. He's got on some blue jean shorts, I think, and a, you know, Under Armour t-shirt. And I'm thinking, what in the world have I got myself into? <laughs> what are we doing? J- J- yeah. Yeah. My worship pastor, Jim Phillips, you're going to be fired for the rest of your life. I'm, <laughs> I'm here. So anyway, long story short, I sit down with this gentleman and he looks at me and he says to me, I want you to tell me your story. And I said, wow, the short version or the long version. And he said, the long version, I want to hear it all. And, um, so long story short. I had been ministering to this gentleman's son who was at uh, Lee University at the time. I'd been ministering and pouring into his son every Sunday, and I had no clue I was doing anything to to reach his son. I was just sharing the gospel and loving people. And right. This man sits down with me, and he says, I want you to tell me what your debts are and what your dreams are. And I said, and I knew it all right here. I said, well, we're $2.8 million in debt. And uh, we bought a piece of property to expand in the future. That was just a whole other story, but it was a very small window to buy another piece of property there at the church. And um, I think that was a half a million dollars. I said, but I want to, my dream is I want to build a church planting institute in the nation of Uruguay. And I want to build an orphanage in Guatemala. And I want to build an, or I want to refurbish an inner city campus in downtown Chattanooga. And I said, this is how much the debt is. This is how much the the Uruguayan Church Planting Institute will be. It was $288,000, I believe. The the uh, orphanage would have been $520,000. And the renovation of the inner city campus, about another 90000 So every time I said an amount, debt, dreams, whatever it was, he wrote his wife wrote it down on her iPad. I'll never forget it. <laughs> and so when he got through, when I got through talking, he looked at her iPad and he goes, yeah, that's what the Lord said to me. And so he looks at me and he says, uh, several weeks ago, my devotion, uh, actually several uh, years ago, I was sitting down at my table a couple of years ago, and my devotion for the day was Luke 6, given it shall come back to you, good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall men, shall men give into your bosom. Hmm. He said, that day I stopped praying, Lord, make me the man who receives. And I began to pray, Lord, make me the man who puts it into other people's bosom. And he Ooh. said to me, today I've come to be that man in your life, Bishop. He said, tomorrow I'm going to wire you and your church $4.2 million. And he said, I want you to pay off the debt. I want you to build an orphanage in the uh, nation of Guatemala. I want you to build a church planning institute in the nation of Uruguay. Renovate the inner city campus and the rest you can put in the church reserves. And, um, I, I almost fainted. I, I literally <laughs> almost yeah. fainted. And, uh, I, the other thing I thought is this is a joke. This is like, they're going to come out of the, you know, of the back in a minute, a camera's on me somewhere. <laughs> Get punched this or is, something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm about, I'm about, they're about to play a big joke. I mean, we're going to all say, ha ha ha, you know, the whole thing. Right. But, wow. It didn't happen, Stephen. It, it happened just like he said. The next day, the gentleman wired the church $4.2 million. We paid off every debt. We built the Uruguayan um, uh, Church Planning Institute. We built an orphanage in Guatemala, and we renovated the small, f- the, the first inner city campus we had. Everybody comes down now, and they see the big campus here that seats, 
you know, uh, over over two thousand people, and it's a big campus. The way it's sure. built, it's just massive. Sure, they see that now, but they don't see the Fourth Avenue campus that barely sat one hundred and fifty people, mm. and we jam packed that on Sunday afternoons for a couple of years. Uh, I had church twice in Ottawa, and then I drove downtown at two in the afternoon. We had the funnest, most amazing move of God there. People were getting saved every Sunday. Drug addicts delivered, and I got threatened by uh, drug kings, and it's the most remarkable stuff that that, that happened. And out of that, um, we were able to come to uh, this campus went on the market, and a person called me and said, I know you're in the inner city. Have you heard Highland Park's church building is for sale? And I said, no, I haven't. Hmm. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. This is an iconic place. I mean, everyone sure. knows it in Chattanooga. And so he said they want an absorbent amount of money for it. But um, I want you, this person who called me said, I want you to pray. And I want you to ask God if he wants you to have it. And uh, I said, okay, well, uh, I'll pray and ask God. I don't even know what that means. So I started praying. I went on a three-day fast and was fixing to say, I don't want that building. Things were going well. Mm-hmm. Churches were growing. The campuses were growing. The inner city was exploding. I don't want absorbent debt. They were right. asking, I think, Stephen, $15 million for the whole campus. Oh, wow. <clears throat> I didn't want absorbent debt. I didn't want an sure. albatross around my neck. But on the third day of the fast, I'm standing in an Atlanta airport asking God, do you want us to have this building? And I was prepared when I got home from my preaching engagement. I'm weak. I'm tired. I've been fasting for three days. I I, I really feel spiritual. I felt aggravated, if I could be honest with you. I'm on the third day of a fast, which is long long enough to get ticked off a little bit. And, um, And so anyway, I'm standing in the Atlanta airport, and I had just asked God, I need you to tell me. So I can put this to rest in my heart. And if you don't speak to me, I'm going to walk away from it. I'm not sure I would have the ability to walk to it, but I'm certainly going to just get rid of this idea. I'm standing in an airport, in the Atlanta airport, at a tram station stop. And the train stops in front of me to take me from tram A to tram C. And the tram operator's voice said these words, careful, doors are closing and will not reopen. And when I heard that voice say that phrase, the Spirit of God arrested my heart. And the Lord spoke to me through that tram operator. I know that's crazy. The Lord said to me, Kevin, doors are closing and will not reopen. This is a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and you are to walk through this door. Well, I start weeping in the Atlanta airport. My assistant's with me. Chris looks at me and said, Bishop, what's wrong with you? I said, I just heard God. He said, what did he say? And I said, doors are closing and will not reopen. And he starts, you know, speaking in tongues. We're having a fit in the Atlanta airport. I come back the next day. I toured this facility that morning and I called the man who called me. I said, I have no clue what you want me to do with any of this. You told me to pray and I'm calling you back to tell you God spoke to me to have this building. And now I'm out here and I have no clue how in the world I'm going to do this. And he said to me, I said, I don't have the money to buy this building. And he said to me, I know you don't have the money to buy it, but I do. And that that gentleman on the phone that day, we made an offer to the real estate agent. And long story short, when they found out I was born and raised a few blocks away and I had been to that church as a boy and I had a vision for the inner city of Chattanooga, Um, they sold us that campus and this campus and uh, we began having church in it. It's massive building. We only had a couple hundred people at our inner city campus. The other campus in Udawa was thriving. It was exploding, but long story short, we bought this campus and started having church and um, started renovating. Not long after we got in it, did we went into a 90 day revival where the glory of the Lord just sat on this house. Yes. And, we baptized 1,100 people in 90 days mm. and uh, still families that are connected to this church to this day after having experienced and encountered the grace and power of Christ whew, during that 90-day revival. I'll never forget. Wow. So it's been a wild journey, uh, Stephen. Lots of you know uh, warfare and setbacks at times, but the goodness of God and the grace of God, as Marvin Winans and my good friend always said, the good days outweigh the bad days, and I won't That's complain. Right. That's so right. it's been a glorious 
journey and a wonderful trip. And uh, we're, we're humbled by all that God has done and is doing and give him all the glory. And we just believe he's just getting started and he's not done yet. Amen. Amen. So um, I, could, I could soak in that for a little bit. That is, that is powerful. I love that. Um, and I, I really do feel the presence of God just on that story. Just even like that, that Me too. just those moments. I just, I could yes, I pray that the listeners and, and viewers of this can just sense his, his hand on their lives right now, that they would know that in the way of the provision, God is, God is seeing ahead of what, yes, sir. what we think we need and mm-hmm. goes before us. That's I good. So. Um, so I'm, I would, I'm curious. Uh, I'd love to hear how, the Uruguay, like what, how that connection come? Is there a family connection? Is just God put it in your heart? Did you go visit it somehow? Like how did that come yeah. about? I just, it's a wild, another wild and beautiful and amazing story. Um, got invited to go and preach in Uruguay. Um, I went and preached in Uruguay. I don't remember the year. You'll have to forgive me, but I went to Uruguay and preached, went to Mont- Montevideo. And then they, we, uh, out of Montevideo, went to a small little area there, area there called uh, Antigua. And um, mm-hmm. I preached uh, and did some mission work there. And I met um, a wonderful Pastor Ramon and Alba and preached in their amazing church. Uh, they're tremendous kingdom leaders there. While I was preaching, um, I don't do this. I'm not given to this type of thing. I would do it, and I have done it before, and I've done it since, but I just don't do this all the time. I don't walk around taking my jacket off and throwing it on people, but I did in Uruguay. The Lord Mm. instructed me in my – the glory of the Lord came in that room that night. I'll never forget that service, and I I had to hurry and get to the airport because I was trying to fly out, but God's presence just hit that house. Mm. And the Lord said – I felt the Lord whisper to me, there was a young man seeking God over in the corner, and the Lord said, I want you to wrap your coat. Now, I'm a big guy. I'm 6'4", and, uh, you know, I, I'm a double extra large, uh, and so I'm a big guy. And this is a small little, <laughs> just the, but he was so, he was like the little King David over in the corner. Mm. I'll never forget it. He's seeking God and crying out to the Lord, and and and, and uh, he's weeping before God. And I went over, I took my sweaty coat off, and I wrapped it around him, and the power of God hit him and me. And, and, and Stephen, uh, he fell out under the power of God and the power of God hit me so strong. It knocked me back. And wow. I left my coat with that young man. And my wife went there to preach in that same place. I, I came home. I told the whole church, you have to go to Uruguay with the whole church has got to go. You, I told Devin, you've got to go to this place. There is a kingdom invasion happening in Uruguay. And we, I uh, sent Dev, my wife, over there. This is a couple of months, maybe six months later. Unbeknownst to her, she has no clue what happened in the service I was in. I mean, I told her the power of God move. I didn't go on all the details. While she's preaching, the Lord says, take your sweater off and throw it on this lady. And Devin, who's very, very tiny and petite, she takes her sweater off and puts it around this lady. And it happens to be the wife of the young man who I threw the coat on and, and you could not have made this stuff up. Like right, you know, right. we didn't know all of this. We had no right. clue this was happening. The oh. power of God hits the young lady. The power of God hits Devin. I think Devin mix, missed her flight. That service got so oily and so full of God's glory. I think she missed her flight. And so when she come home and told me that story, I said, you're not going to believe this. I did that to another young man who was there. Well, a couple of days later, we get word back. That their husband and wife, and we are flipping out <laughs> by that point. Yeah. We're flipping out. So when I go over there, I I meet this couple, and through a series of events, we met with the former pastor, or not not the former, but her pastors there, and on the, and and they had a burden to plant a church on the other side of the island and hmm. uh, in a sort of a different location. Sure. So long story short, we saw the writing on the wall. We started having church under a a, a lean to tent sort of. Mm. and uh and and they were in that for two years and Stephen, just last year we finished uh the the new church building we built a state-of-the-art church building in uruguay on the main road 
They actually built it big enough to put a school in it, and we have started a school over there. Let's go. And uh, that gospel work, uh, Pastor Marcella and Daniela and their beautiful babies, uh, their pastors, you know, they're, they're, they're part of our church family. I mean, they join us every Monday via Zoom um, uh, through technology during our pastors and executive leadership meeting and they're telling us the reports of what's happening and all the lives. We, we built the church and we thought this is going to give us some space to grow. It's already filled. Oh, wow. And, um, they're doing an amazing kingdom work over in Uruguay. And that's uh, wonderful. So we planted seeds, uh, that church planting institute. We became a place that resource all the pastors, um, um, that, uh, are in Uruguay and, uh, they, we resourced, uh, so many leaders gave them opportunity to grow, to be refreshed, to come to um, our campus there and um, just have a reprieve and a time of rest and respite. And so, um, and just getting refueled. Um, and so wonderful things happening in Uruguay and the way God connected it. It, it really is like a book of Acts, you know, connectivity where you, you just went on a mission trip and God connected it with people. Now great That's things right. are happening. So the spirit of the Lord just, you know how I he am. does it, Stephen. He sews yes. it all together. Yes. And, uh, so we, we've been really grateful to see what the Lord's done through that relationship there. Oh, amen. That's wonderful. Well, and then uh, let's see. Okay. So the next part I'm curious about, and we'll probably wrap it up here shortly after this is these are amazing stories. Sure. Um, but I think, uh, I want to hear a little bit more about the human trafficking element, again, your sure. passion and the heart for that and how, and maybe even you can phase into how people can maybe connect with you or to, to help, you know, further that, that mission. Sure. So, uh, human trafficking is obviously something, uh, in my wife's heart, it sort of began and was birthed in her heart. Um, and, uh, from doing it out of just relationship and, you know, relationship connectivity through conversations with people mm -hmm. sort of started that way. Uh, it began with um, the birth of my oldest daughter, Zion. Devin, through a series of dreams and encounters with God, really wrestled, we felt like wrestled the enemy over, an and this is, it may sound strange, but it was an assignment over Zion's life, my daughter that kind of woke up the warrior in my wife mm -hmm. uh, to, to save not only my daughter, not that my daughter was ever actually in trouble, but God would speak through Zion to Devin, my wife. He would speak through my daughter to my wife about um, protecting my daughter and helping other people's daughters be rescued from wow. yeah. something that he would protect her from. And so God gave Devin the scripture for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And so Devin began uh, a ministry called the Zion project and the That's Zion great. project was dedicated and still is dedicated to rescuing women in human trafficking, to providing resources and opportunities uh, of education, of opportunity, of even adoption connectivity. Um, it's just sort of a, a broad, wide umbrella. And over the years, I don't know how many people, I, I, I couldn't even tell you how many people she's helped in various ways, either saving them from prostitution rings or rescuing them from um, a pimp or uh in our situation, this led to her ministry of helping other young ladies actually led to the adoption of both of our children. I think this mm. is a great place to sort of tell that story because yeah. De Devin partners with a number of agencies that have homes and she helps locate places and beds of, of uh, refuge for, for girls. And so yeah. the Zion project has different branches and different, you know, sort of, uh, appendages as it were and sure and one of those uh is uh, a cafe and a tea room where the proceeds of both the together cafe and this I i'll try to stay focused but i'm driving down the road one day and zion project and saving women in human trafficking is devon's thing but i'm driving down the road one day and i literally have an open vision driving down the road i don't have those i'm not always given to those but i see the word together in my windshield, I see the word. I'm driving down the road. I'm thinking, my God, I need angelic assistance as I drive. <laughs> I see the word together in the windshield. Yes, 
Watch this. And the word together splits up into three words to get her. Oh, so we have the together wow. cafe. We have the together cafe, which Come is a on. place of community for yes. our people here. Yes. And, um, and the Lord said to me, in order to get her, you'll have to do this together with other churches wow. partnering together. I have this encounter with God. I called Devin. I'm crying. I'm, <laughs> and I can't deny what I saw. Yeah. And, and, um, I said, we have to go get her, but we have to do it together. So we, we have now the together cafe and, and the proceeds of that help fund and resource several different agencies will have been, uh, I, 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 I'm not versed in all the names, but there's just a number of agencies and ministries sure. that we help. So that's Devin's sort of contribution now is helping resource some of these places. And we wow. have the Genesis house of tea. Okay. And that's a whole other miracle, but I love that idea. Great yes. name. So you have the Genesis, which is my baby girl's name. Genesis. Yes. You have the Genesis house of tea where we are restoring, get this dignity, identity, the sense of royalty. And anyway, this, this is how my wife's brain thinks. And yeah. The Holy Spirit works. Through all <laughs> so them. good. So, so we have these, hopefully these fund raising mechanisms that are a benefit to the community, private, provide jobs for a lot of our students, but also, um, uh, resource ministries in the area. So Devin's helped so many of these young ladies. I'm in North Carolina. I'm preaching. I'm flying home. When I land, I get a call from Devin. I hear the, you know, the quivering in her voice. She's crying. Mm. She said, I just met with another 14 year old girl who is pregnant, 36 weeks pregnant. Stephen, she hid her pregnancy during COVID. Oh my God. 36 weeks. She, she wore a hoodie and yeah. she has this big hoodie on and she's concealed sort of concealed her um, pregnancy wow. and 36 weeks in, she tells her grandmother, I'm pregnant. Do I need to have an abortion? What do I need to do? The grandmother's born again. She calls Devin's agency, gets the phone number from the church, calls Devin's. Devin goes and meets with this 14 year old girl. And this 14 year old girl says, you know, I've been encouraged to have an abortion by my parents, but I want, I want to know if there are other options. Devin gives her the options. And while she's sitting there talking to the 14 year old girl, Spirit of God says to Devin, that girl's carrying your baby. And I land after preaching that night. I hear Devin's voicemail. Call me immediately. I need to talk to you. And uh, I called her and she said, I, I met with a 14 year old girl. And I said, great. That's, you know, sort of what you do. You know, you help these right. people. And she said, no, this is different. She said, while I was meeting with her, the Lord spoke to me and said she was carrying my baby, carrying our baby. And I said, what? I mean, yeah. this is, I'm 40. One, this is the craziest season of our life. We are literally, God is opening doors to him be glory all over the world. I have, I have this mentality. I've had it since I was a young man. When I get to my forties, I'll start being papa. I'll be grandpa, but you know, you can drop the kids off for an hour, <laughs> go eat dinner, come right. back and get them. And you can right. do all of the, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm 41. I've, I've done this four times and long story short. I can hear it in her voice and I feel it in my heart. And uh, I was terrified just to be honest with you. The adoption process scared me to death because I love deep. And when I'm all in, I didn't want somebody to be able to come and take the baby from me. I didn't know how right. it worked. I was ignorant right. it, to be quite honest. So long story short, that precious, I had four weeks to get a house study done to turn a bedroom into a nursery. And by the grace of God, all of it got approved and Ooh. we turned a nursery and a bedroom into a nursery. She's born. She comes out screaming. Devin holds her. I hold her. Her name is Genesis Amaya. She is the sauciest, spiciest <laughs> three-year-old going on 23 you've ever met in your life. But, but here's the most beautiful thing. So that 14-year-old girl yeah. has a 28-year-old mother. That 28-year-old oh, wow. mother, I believe she had two children, but she had 10 abortions. Oh. And she had gotten pregnant with her 10th child. And was about to have an abortion because her pimp demanded, because she mm. was involved in that kind of, you know, um, yeah, lifestyle trafficking and lifestyle prostitution. Mm -hmm. And so the pimp says, you're going to have an abortion. The 14 year old mother of the baby we had adopted called her 28 year old mother and said, mama, don't abort this baby. If you'll let this baby be born, I know a preacher's family that will take wow. your child. Wow. But now we have not talked about this. We have not had uh, discussions. We she's volunteering not, you. Yeah, she's volunteering me without having any kind of uh, a conversation. So Devin calls me. 
And she goes and meets this 14-year-old girl's 28-year-old mother. And the woman looks at Devin and she says, I'm scared to death and I went through this whole thing. She says, but if you'll take my child, I'll have it. And um, and so she, um, I'm sorry. Um, no, I think that's... about Asher every, every time I tell this story. She gets pulled out of that lifestyle. And for six months, we put her in a safe house. Yes. And she has this amazing baby boy who is named Isaac Asher Wallace. And, you know, Isaac means uh, laughter and joy, and Asher yes. means joy as well, so it's double joy. Double and joy. Stephen, every day I look at him, he's two years old, and um, and so he's actually Genesis' uncle by blood. Right. Which is the story I was telling at the beginning. Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. He's her brother by adoption. Every day I look at him, it's the greatest revelation of the love of God I've ever had in my life. Um, and and they'll never know anything but our love. And we'll at some point tell them the story of how God did it all. But to think that that child that brings so much joy to our home was almost never even uh, uh, born. Yeah. That, that almost never even existed. Mm. And to think that I could love him that much when I didn't have to, but I wanted to. Yeah. And one day I'm holding him and the Lord said to me, this is how I love you. And this is how I feel about you. It just is overwhelming. And so um, Devin and I have paid uh, a price over the years. We've lost a lot of people. Uh, in our church because we're very, very vocal, very loudly vocal about life. Hmm. Uh, and I don't just mean being anti-abortion. There right. is a difference between being anti-abortion. I'm not trying to go down some political road. I don't want to get you in hot water here. <laughs> You're, <laughs> but, good. You're but, good. But I, I, I am not just anti-abortion. I, I don't like abortion. I'm against 100% against abortion, but I am pro-life. There's a great yes. difference. Yes. And the church if the church would open its arms to that revelation, I believe a greater revelation of the love of God would settle on the church. Yeah. Because adoption, as I understand the word, it means to the option to add, add, opt, the option to add. I didn't have to add these children, mm. but I optioned to add them to my family. And God didn't have to add me to the family. Right. Right. But he optioned to send his son on a rescue mission. Right. So that me and you and all of us who were right. not in fellowship with God could come into fellowship with our great God through the sacrifice of his son Jesus. That's right. And he loved us with an everlasting love. And every time I pick my baby boy up, I did it this morning before I came here. It, 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 sometimes it, it's, 30 seconds of contemplation. Sometimes it's just five seconds. Wow. Look at how much he loves being in this family and look how much this family loves him. And uh, we'll never forget that. And so, you know, Devin mm -hmm. pours out all, after all these years of helping young ladies and then God supernaturally, and it was supernatural. We adopted two babies on the same home study, which never happens, <laughs> never happens. It all yeah. happened in a period of like, 10 months. We adopted two babies in 10 months, which is a miracle. Wow. And, um, and they're in our family. And, um, again, it, I, 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 you know, I could go down the road with that, mm. uh, the, the, the miracle that, that, that is, uh, and what it sure. means. But I just think the church has an opportunity, not just to be able to identify problems, but to provide solutions for, um, for this sin sick world. We ought to be a solution. Right. And not just able to identify problems. So well that's said. how we got here. And that's sort of the ministry that Dev well has said. with rescuing women and human trafficking. And that's where it's led us to. And, wow. and we're grateful for that part of our journey. Amen. Amen. Um, oh, my boss and, and, and sometimes co-host are on the, here, uh, David, they've adopted uh, to their brother and sister wow. as well. And it was very much one of those very, uh, not a, not that kind of story, but there was a drug, drug laden household. Wow. And, uh, you know, he, every time I get to see them, they come up and, and the love they have in their hearts and the, the exuberance of like, they, they would be lying from across the door and just come give me a hug around the corner over here. It's amazing. And I get to, I, I, I recognize what you're saying. And just like that re 
reflectiveness of going, this is the excitement that we have as yeah. his kids, yeah. right? Like it's remarkable. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Um, I love that. Well, um, so I think we're going to wrap this up here, but this is, this is the, it's another, another, I'll say fun. This has been fun so far and I don't want to diminish that. But anyway, when I say that, so let me just make very clear. This is just a unique part of it. We like to wrap up with a cold rapid fire. And gotcha. so rapid fire is just kind of a, peppering of some fun questions, random questions that, that aren't the story type things like this, but they also might have a story to it. So if it does, that's cool. Um, and one of our favorite ones is just a, you're, you're picking from kind of the favorite food, like something, somebody says, Hey, here's a, here's anything you want to get. What's, what's your go-to for just enjoying some good food? Uh, my go-to is what the Lord Jesus go-to would be. It's Mexican. Uh, there. <laughs> He, go. He, he would have queso and chips, and um, he would have uh, ch- chimichangas. Uh, Ooh, chimichangas. All right. Chimichangas. I mean, it's not a question. It's not even – it's a very distant second, but a very distant second would be fried catfish. But it's – Okay. By and away. All right. Mexican – We'll be in heaven. <laughs> Mexican food will be in heaven. Yes, that's a, a good friend of mine said the the fragrance of the fragrance of the Lord is is a lot like Mexican food. It was <laughs> <laughs> yes, queso is a sweet smelling savor or something. Like that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's good. Um, all right. So, and obviously, you you've traveled quite a bit. You've done a lot of traveling. Um, so this one could have some fun part to it as well. But what is one of your most memorable? And it could be in line with what we've already shared or something else. Memorable places you got to travel. Uh, Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Uh, went to Phnom I went to Cambodia on a mission trip. Went to Phnom Penh and um, saw there um, the, um, oh, what is that place called? It's, it's, it's that old ancient um, city. Like the ruins. Mm-hmm. Yes, the ruins. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, I can't remember. There's a specific name for it that's eluding me now. But yeah. I was mesmerized by life on the other side of the world and seeing uh, that whole area in Cambodia was, was just really remarkable. Really That's remarkable. good. Yeah. And uh, all right. So what, uh, what is one of your, and I'm going to get you in trouble on this one. So I, I, I leave it open, but what is one of your favorite date experiences you got to have with your wife? One of my favorite date experiences that I've had with my wife you know, Devin and I, we've had kids. I feel like we've had kids since nine months after we got born. I feel like we have always had kids. So dates have yep. somehow, without child care, always included kids. But I will tell you this. I know where it was. Um, we're Disney World people. We love Come Disney. On. And yeah. um, we went on a Disney cruise. Uh, these are the most recent things. So it's just cool. on my brain. We went on a Disney yeah. cruise. And there is an adult-only um, hotel. Yeah. Uh, ho- not hotel, an adult only, pardon me, an adult only restaurant. Okay. And uh, we w- put the kids in childcare. Yep. And we went to, I think it was uh, Palato's Steakhouse or something like that. And we were on the boat, on the ocean, watching the sun, eating oh, a five star meal. And we didn't have any screaming kids because Mickey and Donald were handling them for us. And that That's was, right. Uh, that That's was good. An, an amazing <laughs> gift. That was incredible. Amen. Well, I have I have five kids or four, I have four, not five. I have four kids from eleven to. I'm, to I'm like, whoa! Uh, <laughs> I have four uh, from eleven down to four. Uh, just actually just turned four uh, a few weeks ago, and so um, so eleven, eight, about to be six in two days, uh, and four. So wow. I I understand what you're saying when you have have those moments of like, how do we find a date time within within that? Oh, it's it's uh, incredible. Yeah, it's a challenge. Incredible. It is. That's good. Uh, all right. One more here. Let's see here. Um, oh, I know what would be the most memorable or um, yeah, I'll say memorable, memorable person you've got to meet just kind of, maybe it's hmm. then sometimes people think it has to be a movie star or something else. No, not, it could just be somebody that's just really been memorable and experiential for you. You know, I would have to say, geez, how can you do this to me? I'm a massive Tennessee <laughs> football fan. So I've met, uh, and hang, hung out with a few times Peyton Manning. Oh, cool. um, there you go. Yeah. Um, I have, yeah, I, I, I would have to probably go there. I'm just sure. a massive Tennessee football fan. That's so, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's a cool cat. And, uh, in the kingdom, it would probably be, um, 
I don't know. I mean, I'm Reinhard Bonnke. I did get to oh, spend yeah. some time with Brother Bonnke before he went to heaven, and that's um, a blessing. Um, so, yeah, yeah, and and uh, and I'm I have become very very good friends with John Smoltz from the Atlanta Braves, the Hall of Fame okay. pitcher. So okay. uh, I've met him and hung. In fact, we got to have lunch a couple of days ago. So oh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I've got a handful of opportunities to meet yeah. special people. And so, yeah, That's those, neat. those are the folk that stick out in my mind. Yeah, I know. I hear you. And again, I, you know, when I, when I ask that question and, you know, I, I think we, we can find ourselves um, maybe putting somebody higher than they ought to, right? Like you sure. can't put somebody just because they have a title, sure. you know, and sure. then sure. I just mean it's a memorable member for you. And, and so I don't, Absolutely. I don't mean to dim- diminish the no, others no. you've had a chance to meet or <laughs> otherwise, right? But that's the right. question. So, Absolutely. well, good. Well, that has been a wonderful time, uh, Bishop. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you giving this. This has been a fantastic conversation and I think very powerful, uh, memorable for me to get to hear the stories of God's faithfulness. Yeah. And so I hope, uh, if nothing else, you and I had a great time. I hope others got a chance to, <laughs> to, we, to we share in that. I can't tell you what other people say. I know. <laughs> but we had a blast. We had a great time, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you would, let's. So for those who want to follow more, get more information, how? Sure. what's the best way to follow and connect with you? So, you know, we are on uh, YouTube, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook. You can go to Kevin Wallace, and uh, we've been verified on each of those platforms, and okay. uh, even I think on TikTok. Uh, if you want to be uh, resourced with um, the the weekly messages that we preach from the Redemption to the Nations Church, you can get all of that there through Kevin Wallace Ministries. You can also join us on Redemption to the Nations Church page. We have those pages available uh, on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and um, YouTube as well. And then, Stephen, um, for those who might be in ministry, perhaps, uh, you know, I know that there are so many denominations and networks, but maybe there is someone who's watching, who is looking for spirit-empowered connection, resourcing, sort of a a kingdom family that's doing gospel work around the globe. Several years ago, actually six years ago, seven years ago now, we started what we call the Ruach Global Network, uh, RGN. You can go to Ruach, R-U-A-C-H, globalnetwork.com, and you can find out more information about how, how you can be connected and be a part of the family it's not just for uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, although it is certainly geared toward that. But even marketplace leaders have joined sure. the network. And uh, and I don't say that as a plug. I say that as an invitation to someone right. who might be looking for uh, resources or some place of connectivity for spirit-empowered, kingdom-minded people. Uh, that's my heart, and we've seen God do wonderful things around the world and in this nation. And so... I offer that invitation to anyone who might be interested in getting connected and doing life together and doing kingdom work together. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Well, this has been another fantastic uh, GEB Miracle Podcast. Our guest today has been Bishop Kelvin Wallace. And uh, we ask you, invite you to share this with your friends, uh, like and follow on the platform, whether we want to show a special shout out to our pray.com audience, as well as those who may be watching us on YouTube. Um, tell, tell somebody today about this experience you've gotten to have and uh, share somebody the love of Jesus today. Help them live well with his love. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time on the GB America podcast.